How does magic work? Magic is an agreement between the shaitan on one side and the magician on the other. The magician agrees to do certain things for the shaitan, and then of course the shaitan agrees in return to do certain things for the magician. So let's start by looking at the cave. This one is fine. This one's not going to upset anybody, inshallah. Uh, there's nothing in here that's going to be particularly um, horrible. And as I said, I'm going to try and avoid the worst of them because I did have people fainting in previous uh, lectures. Okay. So you see this person has made a circle and they've created an altar at the front. The altar has magical symbols in it and symbolism. Each single symbol has a purpose. Each color of each candle has a purpose. You can see in there, there is a, a little shrine at the front with a triangle. And the use of the circle and the triangle is going to come later on. You'll see that very clearly. Each of those candles has a purpose and a reason. And what this person would be commanded to do would be to sit inside of the circle for a prolonged period of time in a cave. And this is just showing you the cave in which the person would be sitting. They're going to a place known for the possession of the jinn known to be isolated they're sitting inside of that cave and then they are going to be sitting for such a prolonged period of time lighting the candles and beginning to mention the name of the shaitan call upon the shaitan and invite the shaitan to come to their presence and they would usually be asked to relieve themselves in the same circle that they sit in and to sit in their own filth but that's the lightest one. I thought I'd test your, you know, your stomach first of all. <laughs> that's the lightest one. Now let's go and have a look at what magicians do with the Quran. This is a public sewer. It's full of, you know, waste and excrement. And they're trying to fish out something from the public sewer. And we're going to keep going. And the Shaykh, he climbs down into it. And this is what they pulled out of the public sewer. As you can see, this is a copy of the Quran that has been used in a public sewer. It's covered in human filth. It's covered in sewage. And they now have to clean and purify this copy of the Quran. Just in case you thought that was a one-off, we'll show you another video. This one has 51 copies of the Mus'haf that have been disgraced by the magicians. As you can see, they are covered. These are all copies of the Quran. They are covered in knots. They are covered in filth inside of them. They're going to open one of them up. They're covered in pins like voodoo dolls. They're cutting them open and you see the state of the Mus'haf inside. You can see the color of the water that is coming off of the, the uh, copies of the Qur'an as they're washing them, as they're opening them. And they're washing them with uh, rose water, and they're washing them with uh, perfume in order to, to remove the, the uh, excrement that was on them. And they were found in a toilet, in a public sewer. 51 copies of the Mus'haf. And you can see inside the state that these uh, Masahif have been put in. And inside there are metal nails uh, bent over. These are part of the magic. And you can see how covered these uh, Masahif are in, uh, in, in dirt and in, in uncleanliness. Right. What you can see here is a copy of the Quran. And you can see a, a circular, I don't know what to call it, a device. And you can see what the Qur'an is smeared with. The story of this is actually much, much worse. Whatever you can imagine, the story is worse. There was a, a maid who wanted to perform uh, magic upon the family that she was with. She took a copy of the Qur'an, she placed it into this tube, and she placed it where she placed it uh, when she was on her monthly cycle and she covered the Qur'an in menstrual blood. 
This is what magicians do. Here we're going to see another magician. And this magician is going to show how he, again, he's been caught. And part of them being caught is they ask them to, sh they, they ask them to show what it was that they were doing without letting them make shit. They don't let them call upon the shaitan. But they just let them show the idea of what they were doing in order to expose them in front of the people. So the first thing you see is that this man is wearing red from head to toe. He's wearing red from head to toe because the Prophet ﷺ forbade a man from wearing red from head to toe. He lights his incense that is done deliberately to bring the shaitan. It's, not, it's a kind of incense that's well associated with the shaitan. And he begins to perfume a whip and he starts to whip himself. This might remind you of some people. And I'll make no further comment than that. Now, what you can see there is curtains on the wall that again he has disobeyed the Prophet ﷺ by placing curtains all over the wall. And what you see here is blood stains on the curtains. Now, what he would do is he would sacrifice a rooster. The rooster that's associated with the calling of the people to the Fajr prayer. They would sacrifice a rooster to other than Allah. To sacrifice a rooster to the shaitan and then allow it to flap around the room, spreading the blood all over the walls. And then you would see what this person would do. They have some more little tools that they use. They would then lie in a position of humility and a position of, uh, of lowliness. And you're going to see. And they would stay in that position calling upon the shaitan. Calling upon the shaitan to appear before them, calling upon the shaitan to help them, calling upon the shaitan to aid them and to support them. And what they do is they make a contract between themselves and between the shaitan. And this contract is then placed in a number of places. And I'm going to show you some examples. This here is a bird that was confiscated from the house of a magician. And you can see stitched into its wing or onto its tail. I've got all sorts of them, this one. That stitched onto its wing, you have uh, either a, a, a written uh, piece of paper with the magic written on it, or you have various strings and threads that have been blown, the magic has been blown over them. I think the other one is a little clearer, so I'll put the other one on. So this is another, uh, another bird that was confiscated from the house of a magician. And you can see very, very clearly there that it has stitched into its wing uh, a contract that is written between the magician and between the shaitan. You also have an example of they're burying the magic in the graves. So they go out to a grave and they dig inside the grave. They've caught a magician or they've been informed by a magician as to where the magic is hidden. And you're going to see that they bring out from the grave. They've been told what side of the grave to look at and they bring out usually a plastic bag and the bag has various magical items in it. You can see there that you have uh, the letters and the symbols that we're going to talk about tomorrow and you're going to learn about what all about what they those symbols and letters mean. We'll show you another one that comes out of the grave. This is right in the base of the grave, in the middle of the night. They call them out because they've uh, heard that there's some magic buried there and they keep on digging and digging. And eventually they take out this pouch. And they start to open the pouch. And we're going to see what's in it.
That looks like somebody's vest. Inside you have an egg, which is painted or coloured red, may well be blood, and has a number of needles stuck into it. You have um, a tissue, a man's tissue. You have a lemon. You have the head of an animal that was sacrificed to other than Allah. And it's not uncommon for them to put inside of the head of the animal some magic. And you have these writings, uh, you have all sorts, it's covered in blood. You have um, a child's nappy in there. And you have a sanitary towel. And there's uh, some Quran in there as well. And we're going to count the number of pins. You can see in there that there are seven pins. Okay, let's try and analyze a little bit of what we've seen. Each individual item that was put in there was put in there for a reason. Magicians don't do things at random. They do very, very evil and very horrific things, but they don't do them at random. It was put in there for a reason and an aim in order to bring the shaitan and cause a problem. And I'll tell you what happened. The, the story of this, the sheikh who, who gave me the video, he actually was involved in the case and he told me the story. He said, what happened was there was a woman who had been divorced by her husband and she had lost custody of her child. She went to a magician in order to bring her child back to her. She brought her own blood. She brought the child's nappy. She brought some clothing from her husband and his tissue. And she brought um, an animal and the animal was slaughtered to other than Allah. And I want to make something very, very, very clear. The magician in the beginning would do these horrible acts and they would leave Islam. And, and they would, you know, they would sell their soul to the shaitan. However, there's a problem. Once the magician has done that, what's next? The magician says, calls the shaitan, says, I'm willing to make sajda to you. In order for me, you to do something for me. And the jinn and the shaitan say, well, what's the point? You've already disgraced the Quran. You've already left Islam. You've already done the worst of the worst of the worst. There's nothing left to ask from you. So then he says, what can I do for you next to make you carry out my orders once again? And so the shaitan says, now you have to bring other people. It's not enough for you to leave Islam. Now you have to bring other people. And so that magician goes out to convince other people to use their services and to bring them, those other people outside of Islam. And this is something that you see amongst the magicians, is that they don't simply disbelieve. They disbelieve and they become a da'iyah, a caller to get people to leave Islam. And so that woman was asked to bring an animal, knowing that animal would be sacrificed to other than Allah. In the beginning, don't think that this magician sat there with horns, you know, like, and sat there saying, I'm an evil magician. In the beginning, the magician enticed her, look, I can solve your problem, I'm a healer. But when it comes to the crunch, you're going to have to bring me an animal to be sacrificed. She knows and he knows that animal is going to be sacrificed to other than Allah. When he asks her to bring a sanitary towel, he asks her to bring a nappy, she knows what's going to be done with it. But he has to get her to make that step so that she would leave Islam. And when she leaves Islam, then the jinn will now do another act for him and would afflict her husband and cause him to lose the custody of his child and for the child to go back to the mother or afflict the husband to make him love the woman again. And of course, it should be mentioned that they never bring anything good. And they never, ever, ever are successful in what they do. وَلَا يُفْلِحُ السَّاحِرُ حَيْثُ أَتَى The magician will never be successful wherever they are. 
And the husband would go insane, fall in love with his wife once again, go back to his wife. Within a few months, he will have fallen out with her again. It doesn't bring anything but evil for everybody. It doesn't bring people back together.